All right, so what is this right here? We've seen, I do remember Java started this like 1 billion row challenge. I didn't realize that there the, a bunch of, are a bunch of languages now doing this 1 billion row challenge? Is this like a, is this like a thing? Cause I mean, Go sounds fantastic. Yeah. They are. The, the 1 billion row challenge is intended to be a fun exploration of how far modern Java can be pushed for aggregation 1 billion rows from a text file. Okay, so they are. Okay, so effectively, it's how fast can you read and do something with 1 billion rows of data in a language. So it's kind of like, let's, let's, let's go to a pretty far case, and then you have to do super weird programming to make it successful, right? All right, anyways, sometimes around the middle of January, I stumbled across the 1 billion row challenge. I had a lot of fun working on this. I started uh, with an execution time of larger than six minutes and finished at 14 seconds. Okay, okay, this sounds good. What is the 1 billion row challenge? An input, a text file containing temperature values for a range of weather stations. Each row uh, is one measurement in the format of string station name, float measurement. Output, for each unique station, find the minimum average and maximum temperature recorded and emit the final result on standard out in the station's name's alphabetical order with the format this. 14 seconds, dude. I'm not going to lie to you. If I could if if I could last 14 seconds, I mean, that would be an achievement in and of itself, okay? I'm just letting you know. I, I would be stoked. This is fantastic. By the way, 14, 14 seconds to do a billion rows is still very impressive, okay? Same, brother. Yes, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Jo Dude, Java can do a 1.4 second? Damn. What a lucky man. What a lucky man. Uh, let's see. No constraints working with this. Temperature values are within uh, effectively 100 up, 100 down. Okay. Okay. The temperature value has only exactly one fraction of a digit. The byte length of the station is within this. There will be a maximum of 10,000 unique stations. Rounding of the temperature must be done using semantics of IEEE 754. Rounding direction, round towards positive. I don't, what is, what is round towards positive? Does that mean you just, you just always round up? You effectively just seal, it's in the name, dummy. You just seal at all times? I thought we just called that seal. By the way, every time I say seal, I just, I literally cannot help but to think, I, every time in my head, somewhere deep down, I go, arr, arr, arr. Every single time I make a weird sound. Like, I say, okay, that's, it sounds much weirder when you do it out loud. You know, now that I, now that I did it out loud, that sounds weird. Okay, now that I've done it out loud, I feel kind of weird about it, but that's what I think about every single time. You ruin seal for me? Yeah, I'm going to ruin seal for you because now you're going to think about seal seals the whole time. The wrong kind of seals. Okay? What are you going to do? I think of Batman forever. What? Okay. I know we're like trying to stay on, on, on track. Can somebody, can somebody please explain Batman? Can, please. Can you explain why you think of Batman forever when you see the word seal? Kiss from a rose. Seal. Wow. That's a, wow. Okay. 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 Hey. Okay. 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 Uh, sounds simple enough. What's the catch? The input file has one billion rows. How big is a billion? It's it's less than a trillion. I can tell you that much. If you started counting to one billion at a rate of three seconds per number, that would take my guess is ninety nine years, ninety five years. Okay, I was close. I thought it was 33 years per billion if it's one at a second. Anyways, the challenge is to process the file to print out uh, the output in the least amount of time possible. Uh, it's summarized nicely in this picture. Okay, yeah, yeah. Tools I'm working with. The challenge was initially inter uh, induced, introduced for Java, but folks started trying it out in different languages. You can check out the discussion about the one BRC in Golang. I solved this using Golang 1.21. All benchmarks are ran on an Apple M1 Pro. Apple Silicon mentioned. Apple Silicon mentioned. Apparently, Sushi Dragon told me a really cool story where he is like he is exploring the Apple M1 stuff for uh, for his kind of really crazy streaming setup, and it consumes like significantly less energy and it's just as fast and he's like very happy about it apple fanboy exposed do i don't even own an apple i actually i might i actually am curious if i do Anyways, a 2021 model with 16 gigs of memory and a, a 10 vCPU. Uh, the input file with 1 billion rows is about 16 gigabytes. You can find the GitHub repository with my solution here. I took the approach of solving this iteratively. Doing so helped me track my progress. You can find the iterations documented in the repos readme. With each iteration, I focused on optimizing one of these three areas, data structure, concurrency, reading the file. Now that all of this is out of the way, let's dive in. By the way, I do want to do this again. This would be like one of the things I'd want to do full-time content creation, creationing. I wonder, so what would be kind of fun is, do you think that, who do you think would produce better code, Gemini 
Grok or Jippity to solve this problem? Or Copilot? None? Probably none. They would all produce so. shitty ones. I love you. Grug? Minstrel? Is Minstrel a thing? Dolly? Dolly will just produce images of the weather stations? Uh, you are AI. I am. I am. I am. I'm definitely not like... I'm definitely... I'm definitely not like not general AI. I'm definitely... Uh, I'm still learning. I still have some problems. I, it's hard for me to self-learn. We're getting places. All right, baseline implementation. I start with a naive implementation to establish the base, uh, baseline runtime. The first iteration did uh, not make use of any concurrency. Good. Uh, read a file line by line. The input file, each line can be processed independently, so I started by reading the file line by line. For this, I used uh, Buff.io's scanner with the default split function, scan lines, a pretty standard way to read the file, uh, read a file line by line in Golang. Scanner is handy interface that reads from file and, see, and returns contents up to the split defined. For us, this means a new character slash n will not be returned for each line. Okay, that makes sense. So we won't have to handle it separately. Foreshadowing. This is where the problem lies with this method of reading a file. Okay, interesting. Okay. AI, Vito mentioned. Vito mentioned. Did I just get a Vito? Thank you, Toaster Chicken. I appreciate that. Thank you. By the way, I, I left alerts on. Boys, we left alerts on. Alerts were on. Yeah, I did. I walked on stage. It was fantastic. Uh, data structure. Map to store all the temperature values recorded for each. Yeah, okay, this is what I would do as well. The output requires minimum, maximum, and average temperatures rounded in each city. So I initialized, initially started with the map that stored the t all temperatures recorded for each unique station. Each station stored a string type, and each temperature stored a float64 type, making this map signature map string float. Okay, fair. Oh, wait, hold on. Wait. No, that's no, 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 no. He said that wrong. That's a that's a an array of floats. You stored all the arrays. You didn't just. Why would you store all the arrays? Anyways, I wouldn't even think about storing the arrays. I would just I would assume you'd just do a sum and account, right? I discovered your channel recently. Oh, thank you. As each line read from the file, values were added to this map accordingly. After the uh, the entire file file contents are read and the map is constructed, we iterate through each key value pair in the map and calculate the min, max, and average values. Okay, so this is, who here would probably create it something like this? Who would do something along this whole line of just reading line by line, throwing it all in a map, and calling it a day? I think a lot of people would probably start there. A lot of people would start there. I would have started with the aggregate value with count and sum, min, and max. I always reduce my loads when I can. Damn. Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't start with an array because an array just requires more programming. For me, just being able to just do a quick if check as each one comes through, it just feels easier, if that makes sense. I wonder what the, I wonder what the answer is. So in my head, before looking forward, be without looking at what the, the better thing to do is, is that there has to be a way that you'd want to pass these values. You want to be able to effectively have a bunch, you want a bunch of threads doing something, right? But... You need to be able to, oh, you need a way so that you can split out all these threads without, now this is the big trick here. You want to be able to do it without having to use a mutex, right? Because that's where things get all, that's where things get all terrible is once you use a mutex, you then cause, you cause things to slow down. You don't want to do that. So you could imagine that you could have like almost what it's like how I would refer to it as like a, a consistent hash, right? So you could, you could imagine that in my head how I would try to speed things up is that every city that starts with an A goes to a specific um, thread that's running. And each one goes to a different thread. So all A's are sorted in one area. All B's are sorted in one area. All C's are sorted in one area. So that way, there's no. They can all just run independently. That, like at least that's how I would. I would like a thread index by key. Exactly. That's like how I would think of it. I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's any good. But that's. I. I would use a, some sort of consistent hash. That's like. That's what I would. That's like. That's the first thing I think of. How? Let's see. How would you load? Let's see. How would you balance the load? Then I wouldn't try to balance the load. Not at first. Right. Because I don't know if there's any sort of like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I wouldn't do this either. So someone just said do this right here. I wouldn't do this either. So this is, so the reason why you don't want to do this is that there's 1 billion rows. You'd have to do 1 billion uh, divided bys. What you do is you just have a sum and a count, right? If you just have a sum and a count, you already know the average at the very end, right? So that way you only do 10,000 divides, 
right? You don't need to balance the load. First, uh, first up a number of Go routines that is guaranteed to be greater than 2x the cores and send messages in. See, that's kind of what I want to do. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, right? If you just have the sum and count, you're good. Uh, won't the sum possibly overflow? Use a 64 then. Well, you got to remember, look at this. Uh, will the sum overflow? There's some rules to it, which is the temperatures between negative 999 and positive 999. So that means you already know that you can only be less than, uh, you know, you won't be any less than negative 100 and greater than 100. So a billion of those would be 100 billion, right? If it was all positive numbers in one location, that's 100 billion. That means you only need like what? A 38-bit number to store all those. So a 64 is plenty, right? It overflowed in 32, but you're using a float 64 anyways. I just use the middle out strategy. Everyone's pretty much favored. Okay, let's keep on going. But that's how I would want to do it. All right, concurrency processes. Uh, each mix, let's see, stations, min, max, and average temperatures in separate go routines. Okay, the first place I introduced concurrency was the last stage of execution. For each city in, in the map, I instantiated a new go routine to process the city's min, max, and average temperatures. Oh, that's clever. Okay, so he went with... Literally just do it on a per-city basis. Okay, interesting. Uh, I code up to this point can be found here. So in my head, I'd rather use a, uh, a fixed-sized array. This improved performance by 100 seconds. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Can someone drop the article for this? Yeah, this is a great, this is a great, this is a great article. 100 seconds. That's pretty impressive. Okay. Okay, I like it. Uh, this is inefficient because we're spinning up too many Go routines. A maximum of 10,000, uh, one for each station. The Go scheduler is spending more time managing the Go routines than actual work. We will fix this in the future iterations. Okay, okay. Concurrency, decoupling reading and processing of file contents. Currently, we are reading a line from the file, parsing the station name and temperature, and adding it to a map and then reading the next line. Doing this sequentially means that we are not taking advantage of all the CPU cores. Instead, we are reading a line, waiting to finish processing it before reading the next line. To overcome this, I decoupled reading and processing of lines. I introduced two Go routines, a producer Go routine responsible for scanning lines and a consumer Go routine uh, to process reading these lines. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so now this is we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Sup? What's up, baby? I like I like where this is going. This is a good idea to communicate between these two go routines. Uh, send the read lines from the producer to, to the consumer go routine. I used a channel. All right, channels are blocking. The best way explained by the concurrency in Go by Catherine uh, Cox Boudet. All any go routine that attempts to write to a channel that is full will wait until the channel has been emptied. Any go routine that attempts to read from a channel that is empty will wait until the uh, one item is placed in it. I just assume you make your channel big enough, right? Isn't that like just like an easy way to kind of avoid it? This means if we don't use uh, a buffer channel, uh, when one go routine is executing, the other will be blocked. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm a genius. I'm a genius. Uh, let's see. Using an unbuffered channel, the execution time indeed increased twofold. Nice. CPU profiling the code, we can see uh, the most amount of time is going in go routine switches. Okay, so we pretty much just sit there and... Is that what this is? So I don't know what these things are that are... I can't read this because I don't understand it. I guess, let's see, go ready funk. Is go ready funk that one or is it this one? Oh, schedule. I guess, yeah, runtime.schedule. Yeah, it looks like runtime schedule and runnable is just like... Just like getting whammed right there. Woof. Woof. This makes sense and aligns with our understanding of unbuffered channels. Okay, using a buffer channel. Using a buffer channel with capacity 100. I just... Why, why stop at 100, okay? Like, why stop at 100? Why not 1,000? It's a billion rows. Uh, anyways, using a buffer channel with capacity 100, we see the performance increase by 50% compared to the unbuffered channel. So that means you're at four and a half minutes, so you're back to, like, nominal. Okay, that does not look like 50% there, buddy. Okay, that's not 50% there. I don't know if you guys can see that, but five minutes and 22 seconds is not 50% of nine minutes and 12 seconds. Okay, we're doing some loose, we're doing some loose, ma some loose math here. All right. <laughs> Make channel 1 billion. All right. The code and profiles I'll point to can be found here. Okay, we. I feel like all this is like making sense because we haven't done anything different, really. Like, if you really think about it, we haven't done anything that is fundamentally changing how much work he's doing. Uh, but this still got slower than the previous iteration. Looking at the CPU profile, we noticed that there is a, sig a significant time going into uh, runtime channel receive. People are just hanging out doing nothing. Let's see. 
What are we looking at? What are we looking at? I do like, okay, I do want to take a pause here for a quick second. I really like that he's taking the time, and even though I feel like I could just improve this immediately, he's not doing what he thinks is faster. He is first profiling and then thinking about what he should do. So you can see right here, read file line by line into map is going real slow, and channel receive is a huge portion of it right here. Right? And then you can see this one right here. A lot of P-thread condition weight. A lot of time spent in P-thread condition weight and you sleep and this. So these all seem very excited. If I remember correctly, if you keep a nice discrete uh, stack size like 100, Go will keep the references on the stack, which makes it much faster. Oh, okay. That's good to know. I like this. Setting a slice of lines uh, on the channel. One way to reduce the number of items we send on the channel is to chunk a few lines together in a slice and then send it over to the channel. This means the channel type will change from string to string array. Okay. Okay, buffered channels. This, this, this seems like a good idea. Since the channel type is slice, to avoid race conditions, we need to create a copy of the slice to send it over the channel. Alternatively, we can use sync.pool and reuse the memory in the limitation, let's see, in limit memory allocation. I would just, one would just simply assume that creating a new array might be easier. I don't see why. Uh, anyways, whatever. Go has a handy uh, data race detector, which can be used by adding dash race flag uh, when running your code. Okay. Look at that. I don't, I don't even want to know about all this. All this code. Uh, code after these cha Lizzie changes in this state. Uh, running this, execution time comes down by 160 seconds. Now, this is real. This is good. If Go is keeping things uh, on the stack, uh, then memory allocation shouldn't be a huge concern. I'm not sure. You, I don't think you can keep this on the stack. Can you? I'm not really sure how that would work with passing stuff through channels and keeping things on stack and stuff like that. In my head, I don't. I don't I'd have to write it myself pretty much to understand why that works because I don't. It will only keep the references on stack. Judo isn't all references always on stack. Unless if you have a unless if you have a double pointer, how do they keep a how do they keep a reference on the on the heap? Because don't you need a reference from the stack to look it up on the heap? Judo, now you're now you damn confusing me, Judo. Okay, something has to be on the stack. Anyways, data structures. Use uh, in 64 instead of float 64. Really? At this point, I added test in the CI and realized my tests were failing due to how I was rounding. According to the constraints, rounding should be done using the semantics of IEEE 754 rounding detection round towards positive. I fixed this by parsing the temperature, string into int, and then doing a summation int and converting it to a float 64 only after the calculations have been done. This ended up improving considerably by almost 40 seconds. Wow. That's a lot. This ended by, I'm surprised by that. I was surprised to see that, uh, that there's such a significant performance improvement with this change. I guess parsing a float is significantly more complicated than parsing an int. I think that makes, I think that makes sense. Now that I think about that, I think that probably makes a lot more sense that parsing, a, parsing an int has to be easier. Well, because floats can be like represented in all sorts of different, I mean, there's so much to floats. It's about CPU registers. I mean, Parsing a float is more work. Yes, I assume there's, there's, because an int is just literally, it's just a specific character range with a minus sign, right? Floats have more. The data is fixed, uh, fixed point. Yes. But I'm just saying an int is, but I can't imagine it's that much. Anyways. I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. Results will wild very uh, widely based on uh, CPU architecture, individual ALU FPU performance, w uh, as well as actual numbers of ALUs and F uh, FPUs available per core in uh, superscalar designs, which influence how many independent operations can be executed in parallel. This means your hardware will play a major factor in determining how much this change will contribute to performance improvement. A classic it depends moment. <laughs> There we go. Look at that. There we go. That's the data structure we were talking about. I knew this would be the best. I just knew it. Uh, and the baseline, this feels like a very obvious one, right? And it also feels easier, honestly, because then you don't have to, you don't have to take, you don't have to take a value, read it, 
put it into an array, and then later re-go over all the values and keep track of all four of those things. It said you can have that all as one operation, which just makes it seem like it's way easier. right? In the baseline implementation, we're using a map of a uh, string to float, uh, float array where the each station we are storing all the temperatures recorded. This is wasteful as we don't actually need to store the temperatures, and it's just honestly simpler. We can uh, simply store the minimum, maximum, sum, and count of all temperatures. With this change, we'll see performance improvements for two reasons. One, decreased memory allocations. This will go from storing a slice of around 100,000 uh, in 64 items to uh, let's see, more or less equaling whatever this is to ex storing exactly four. Oh, really? You're not doing an object. You're doing uh, You're doing like a little array? Okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense. I like that. By the way, I love this kind of stuff. When you when you toss in an array like this, I like it. I like that. Uh, this significantly decreases our memory footprint, decreasing the number of go routines. In the last step, we can get rid of spinning up go routines to process temperatures for, of each station, as we already processing the min, max, uh, and count values while constructing the map itself. This means the go scheduler needs to worry about significantly lesser number of go routines. Making this change, uh, the execution time went down by 70 seconds, which is a huge amount. At this point, let's see, code and profiles uh, till this point can be found here. Okay, look at that. We're getting low. We're getting low. I like this. Optimizing all three. Read chunks instead of one line at a time. Ooh, yeah. So in other words, my guess is this is just like take a file and read out whatever is like optimal to read out. I don't know what I don't know if there's like an optimal amount of space you should read from a file, but you can instead of having something that scans it in, right? You can just read a huge chunk and then you can just do it yourself. Uh, in the baseline implementation, we use buff IO scanner and read by file contents line by line. While this is a handy interface, it reads the file contents, performs some checks, and then iterates uh, over it and returns a single line without white space character. If we read each file uh, in chunks, it will help uh, performance in two ways. Single iteration over the bytes when parsing the city temperatures. We will avoid iterating over bytes that scanner F internally does. Yep. You get, uh, yeah, you get a little... You get some nice ones right there. It depends on the situation. 128K is a good general value. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hey, hi from YouTube. Hi. This makes sense because you also get you. I mean, both are O of N, but N drops a constant, right? To reduce the number of items sent over the channel, we will be sending 100 lines together in a string slice. We are sending one, uh, 10,000 items over the channel if we read 64 megabytes uh, chunk from the file and send it over the channel. That will be 256 items. Very significant reduction. Okay, this is this is actually pretty neat. I like this. To process each chunk independently, we should end uh, in a new line. We can do this in two ways. After the chunk is read, read until the next new line, concatenate the two bytes, and send it over the channel. Slice uh, the read bytes uh, till the last new line. The leftover chunk can be sent along with the next chunk read. That's how I do it right here. I would assume that you could just have an array that already exists and just mem copy it into your like temp array. And then you don't have to like, you don't have to do something clever like this because that's way too clever. It's way too clever trying to do making it work out. I first went with the first option as it was more clean to write and required less slice copying. To implement, I decided to use a buffered IO buff reader. Uh, I read a file in 64 megabyte chunks. Let's see. Uh, to read until the new next line character, I use read bytes method. This did not improve performance as read bytes method again iterates over the characters to find the delimiter. But there's something more. Both scanner scans method and readers read method internally calls OS read. But as they provide more functionality beyond simply reading the file, they do extra processing on top of it. Look at the implementation for each. Okay, so they do stuff. They do stuff. For our use case, we really don't need these convenient helper interfaces. I can directly just call OS read. This all makes sense. This is great. This is a great step-by-step, -step, like, how to reduce stuff. And a lot of this stuff is, I think, everybody in this channel right now, like, anyone in this channel find, like, a lot of this stuff too confusing? Or does this all just make sense? Because this feels like a really great... This feels like a really great, simple optimization problem where none of it is, like, wild optimizations. This is also really great, like, you can just watch the person's thought process, which I think is just fantastic. Confusing for me because I'm kind of stupid. I know, but, like, which part is confusing? Like, you could imagine that using something that reads over your data multiple times is not as fast as something that can just read the data out and give you each one of those chunks. Like, you're reading once versus reading twice. Coroutines are confusing, but just because I don't know, go. Okay,
fair, I guess. It sounds uh, like a really good and thorough thought out uh, commit. Uh, I still have no idea what you're talking about, though. <laughs> it sounds absolutely amazing. So it's kind of like uh, Rings of Power. Absolutely amazing. It's really well thought out. Everything is fantastic. Most average piece of stuff you've ever seen. That's how I think about it. And it really, that wasn't a very good analogy, but I just wanted to make fun of Rings of Power. It was just like, that's really all I really wanted to do. I'm just, I, that's actually just what I wanted to do. Anyways. Hey, Nightshade, dude. Thank you. 51 months of Karen. Oh, dude, hype train incoming. Can you guys hold on? I'm in the process of reading something. All right, hold on. Let's look at this. Let's look at the last one. Hold on, people. Uh, since we are now sending chunks over the chunk channel, the chunk consumer uh, go routines are the first spitting, let's see, splitting the chunks into lines, processing each line and sending it over to the line channel. The line consumer channel finally constructs the summarized map. These chunk consumer go routines... Uh, can work in parallel as they're not adding values to the map directly. To take advantage of all the CPU cores, I spun up a number of vCPUs minus one of chunk consumer go routines, each concurrently taking chunks from the channel, processing it, and adding lines to the line channel. Okay, interesting. So you'd have, a, is he saying you have a read channel that just like sends a bunch of data through? Then you have like a chunk channel. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that makes sense, right? For so for each 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 step, that would make sense. If you could just read, you could get like 64 megabytes, send that 64 megabytes over, and then you start reading again, which takes a non-zero amount of times, and while that non-zero amount of time is going, you are processing and creating new lines right there, which I think is fantastic. Gluns. Okay, guys, I'm still in the middle of doing this. Thank you for the hype train. Hold on, I'll say thank you in a moment. I mean that 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 this that makes sense, right? The chunk channel uh, consumed by the chunk consumer, go retains 250 items. The line slice channel over the line channel constructs the final map. Okay, the total number of items sent and received from all channels is around that. Okay. Uh, to reduce this, each chunk consumer go routine can process a chunk into a mini summarized map. This map can be sent over to the map channel. The final map can be created by combining the mini summarized maps. Hmm. Uh, 250, uh, let's see, 250. Uh, file chunks sent over the chunk channel plus 250 and mini summarized maps sent to the map channel. I'd like, dude, I want to explore this so much. Uh, implement, they are finally able to get it to 28 seconds. Okay. Improving uh, string to in 64 parsing. Looking at the flame graph, we still see a considerable amount of time in going into this. <laughs> Does, isn't this just like emotional, by the way? That now you're getting to this level of improvement. Because if you look at this, there is quite a bit right here. Right? So 8. One uh, percent. That's a lot. Initially, I used uh, stir convert parse int to convert the string to UN64. Uh, looking at the implementation of stir convert parse int, it does a lot of checks that we don't necessarily need ourselves. At. Like one thing about this data is you know it's all correct. So technically, you could read until the point, and if it's always round up, do we even need the rest? Wouldn't you just read till semicolon, then read until period? Like, couldn't you honestly just do that? There is uh, there is our arc. Oh, is there an arc mutex? Is there an arc mutex hash map at the end? Reading sequentially will always be better than spawning uh, n threads. Yeah, I mean, I want to play around. I want to play around. What about uh, x point zero? Then you need to make sure that the like, yeah, uh, yeah, negative one point five needs to be one exactly. It's kind of interesting. There seems to be something that's very interesting there, which is if it's negative, you don't add one. If it's positive, you check to see if the last item of the point is a zero or not. If it's a zero, let's see, uh, 0 0.9 will turn into zero, not one. That's not rounding up, is it? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem that doesn't seem right because the whole thing was rounding up. It had a very specific thing. You always round towards positive infinity, right? All right. Let's see, further optimizations. I only got this far with the challenge deadline, January 31st. There's a lot more to explore. Some ideas with the latest CPU uh, trace flame graph. The most of the time now seems to be going to map access and assign. Potential ways to optimize this using numeric keys in a map. So one thing you know is that you have alphabetically sorted, uh, you need alphabetically sorted items and you have 10,000. I wonder if there's something there that could make sense with being able to put them into I'm very curious about that. Like, how can you make it so you don't have to look stuff up in a map? I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't, I have no idea. A tree would be six, something like that. But a tree, I assume, would be slower than a map. You look like someone that was in the military. I was not, but thank you, though. Um, anyways, replaced in built in maps with fast string maps or Swiss maps. I don't even know what a Swiss map is. Uh, is it a very, like, 
neutral map, replace map uses with the tree data structure. I wonder, I wonder how that would work, because how do you store the tree data? Like, what do you store it in? Don't would you store it? Isn't I guess yeah. If if your if your node was an array of twenty six slots, right? Then yeah, because then you don't then you don't need to do that because then you literally just take a uh, you literally just take your your character and you look it up in that position offset into it. Does that make sense? A tree. Uh, this is called a tree. A tree is just like an auto auto complete. A tree would be really good for inserting, but it might be awful for printing out the final answers. Yeah, because you have to traverse the tree. And you'd have to construct those things. Unless if you have the leaf node contain the constructed values. I hadn't used unsafe uh, so far because I wanted to see how far I can get without it. Turns out a lot. MMAP uh, can be used, let's see, can uh, be used to get better results than IO speed. Uh, methods from Go's unsafe package can also be used for string and byte manipulation. Okay. Interesting. I had a lot of fun working on this. Massive shout-outs to Gunnar uh, Morling uh, for putting this together, uh, challenge together. By the way, this was awesome. This was fantastic, uh, the challenge. I cannot believe how great this challenge was. I started with a rather impressive execution time of greater than six minutes and brought it down to 14 seconds. I actually, I, I want to do this because I don't, I have never used any of, like, I haven't really used a lot of, like, this is, this seems like a great way to learn the language you want to learn. Because I want to learn more Go. Go is kind of like the language I want to learn. So this is a uh, this is on my this is on my shit list now. It is. Well, hey, go follow it on Twitter. Go follow. Boom. Followed. Amazing. Absolutely out of control. This was fantastic. We'll link. I'll, I'll try to make sure I link all of that in the uh, on the stuff. All right. Hey, the name. You know what the name is. You know what the name is. Hey, Pratate. It is Pratate. The Pratate. <laughs> the Pratate agent. The Billigen. The one billion agent. I don't know. What, what is the name? What is the name? What is the name? What is the name? The name is the Prime Gen. Thank you very much. Spelt with an A at the end. Thank you.